Still today, most of our primary energy needs are met thanks to fossil fuel, which comprise of coal, oil and natural gas. Yet, as well known, the burning of fossil fuel releases into the atmosphere greenhouse gases, which are responsible for the phenomenon of global warming and ocean acidification. And amongst these gases, carbon dioxide, or CO2, is the most dangerous, being first by far by quantity released into the atmosphere. Aware of this problem, most world nations are actively working towards reducing the CO2 emissions and have recently ratified the commitment by signing the Paris Agreement, thus committing to reduce emissions to a level that would theoretically avoid world average temperatures to rise over 2 degrees Celsius by 2050 compared to pre-industrial level, an upper limit that would theoretically avert the worst consequences of climate change. Today, fossil fuels account for about 80% of world primary energy demands, and to reduce this dependence, two are the major solutions promoted. Increasing energy efficiency, so reducing the amount of energy required per process, and boosting the uptake of renewable energy technologies, which have lower carbon density. Yet, a complete phasing out of fossil fuel is not feasible in the short term. And even in the most optimistic of the scenarios, by 2050 fossil fuels will still account for about 40% of primary energy use. So how to mitigate the dangerous emission into the atmosphere? Well, the solution is represented by Carbon Capture and Storage Technologies, or CCS. The greatest contribution to CO2 emissions comes from three main sectors. Power stations, aimed at generating electricity. The heavy industry sector, which includes mostly metals and cement manufacturing, and the petrochemical sector. Carbon capture and storage is a technology that allows to cut the CO2 emissions by over 90%. The process can be separated in three phases. The capture of the CO2, the transport to the storage site, and finally the injection underground. So now let's have a look at the specifics of each of these phases. Firstly, carbon dioxide is captured at the emission site. This involves the separation of CO2 from the mixture of gases generated from the use of fossil fuel. The separation process can be performed in different ways. Yet, nowadays the most mainstream method is called chemical absorption, a mature methodology already established commercially in the gas processing industry in which specific liquid solvents, typically almonds or ammonia, react to carbon dioxide, separating it from other gases. Other separation processes less diffused include, for example, adsorption, membranes, cryogenic distillation, algal systems, and more. The specifics of the separation method employed depend, however, on the type of capture approach chosen and ultimately on the nature of the flue gas. Currently, there are in fact three main approaches or technologies employed to capture CO2, post-combustion, pre-combustion, and oxyfuel. Post-combustion is today the most diffused technology as it can be retrofitted in existing plants and can be applied to both power plants and industry. As the name suggests, the carbon capture is performed after the combustion of fuel and for this reason, this method is considered an end-of-pipe technology. The process is quite simple. Firstly, fuel is injected into a boiler where it burns with air thus generating heat that is used for various purposes such as industrial heating processes or electrical generation. This combustion also generates a flue gas mostly made up of water, CO2 and nitrogen which ultimately flows into an absorber tower from the bottom of it. As the gas rises up in the tower, a liquid solvent is added from the top reacting with the CO2 contained in the flue gas, adding to it and creating a solvent CO2 solution which sinks into a column and leaves from the bottom of the tank while the rest of the flue gas leaves from the top. The solution is then pumped up into another column, the stripper tower, where it is heated up to about 120 degrees Celsius, causing the separation between the solvent and the CO2. The solvent is recollected at the bottom of the column to be reused and the CO2 leaves from the top of the column and can be compressed for transportation to storage sites. Post-combustion generally allows to capture about 90% of the CO2 produced and of all CCS technologies, this process achieves the highest degree of purity for carbon dioxide captured. 
Today, this method is widely diffused as it does not require fundamental changes to the plant processes. Yet, this technology requires a high initial capital investment, given the large volume of gas that must be handled at power and industrial sites. Additionally, this is a quite an energy-intensive method which reduces the overall efficiency of power plants by reducing their electricity output by more than 30%, a disadvantage known as an energy penalty. Ultimately, all these factors can be in turn increase electricity unit generation cost up to 140% in coal fire plants and 60% in gas fire plants. And the second technology is pre-combustion. In this case, CO2 is removed from the fuel used before combustion. Pre-combustion is not used as much as post-combustion, mainly because of the increased cost involved with a plant that uses this technology, and also because of its more limited applications, which mostly include electricity generation and chemical production. The process can be simplified in a few main passages. At first, an air separation unit separates air into its basic components such as oxygen and nitrogen and produces a stream of almost pure oxygen, which is then injected into a gasifier tank where fuel is added. The result of this gasification process is a syngas that comprises mostly of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water and hydrogen. This syngas is then passed in a shift reactor where steam is added in a process that converts the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Finally, the carbon dioxide is captured generally using the process of chemical absorption in a similar way as in post-combustion. CO2 it is then dehydrated and compressed, ready for transport. Byproduct of this method is hydrogen, which is then generally burned to a power cast turbine and generate electricity in a process that usually includes a heat recovery steam generator to produce even more electricity. Alternatively, the hydrogen can be used in industrial processes that require it as raw elements. This method in general allows to capture up to 90% of all the carbon dioxide produced, yet other variants of the process can be employed at lower cost but they reach lower capture levels. In particular, examples exist in which no shift reactor is installed, breaking down the cost considerably but limiting the carbon capture to levels between 18 and 30%. A significant advantage of this technology involves its lower energy density when compared to post-combustion. In fact, in case of application on power plants, the energy penalty incurred with pre-combustion is generally lower than 20%, yet a major drawback of this technology is the fact that it cannot be retrofitted to existing plants, but instead needs to be built simultaneously with the facility, thus hindering the application to old coal power plants responsible for the greatest share of carbon dioxide emissions from electricity generation. The last type of technology employed for carbon capture is called oxygen fuel combustion. Where fuel is turned with pure oxygen instead of air, this technology can be employed for capturing carbon dioxide from both power plants and industrial sites that include combustion in their processes. The process is so summarized. At first, oxygen is separated from the other components of air in a quadratic air separation unit. The oxygen stream obtained then flows into the boiler where fuel is added and combustion takes place. This generating heat that is used for various purposes. The fuel gas generated by the combustion consists mainly of carbon dioxide and water, which is recirculated into the boiler to control the temperature, and is gradually cooled in a condensation unit where carbon dioxide can be separated by condensing of the water, and finally be compressed for transport. 
Compared with most other combustion technologies, oxygen fuel combustion has the inherent advantage of generating low emissions of nitrogen oxides, which are responsible of smoke and acid rain. Unlike post-combustion and pre-combustion, there is no need to add a major chemical process to capture CO2. Oxygen fuel combustion allows to capture up to 100% of the CO2 emission generated by turning fossil fuel. The main disadvantage of oxygen fuel combustion capture technology is the method of separating oxygen from the air, which is very expensive and energy intensive. As a result, the costs associated with the deployment of this technology are very high and represent a major barrier to this large-scale application. Once that the carbon dioxide has been captured and compressed, the second phase of the process involved is transport. CO2 can be transported safely contained in the liquid form by road, ship or pipeline or a combination of these methods to a storage. Finally, once it reaches the destination, the CO2 is injected underground in carefully selected porous geological rock formation. They are typically located several kilometers below the Earth's surface, with pressure and temperature such that carbon dioxide will be in the liquid or supercritical phase. Suitable storage site can include former gas and oil fields or deep saline formations. Once injected, Carbon dioxide moves up through the storage site until it reaches an impermeable layer of rock known as the cap rock, which traps the carbon dioxide in a process called structural storage. This will eventually lead the carbon dioxide held to bind chemically and irreversibly to the surrounding rock in a process called mineral storage. An alternative to dedicated geological storage is represented by enhanced oil recovery a technique widely diffused, especially in the United States of America. In this case, CO2 is injected into depleting oil fields in order to increase the amount of crude oil that can be extracted. This allows to recover oil that is generally not recovered with traditionally other methods, quota that can be in excess of 60% of the original oil in place. Today, there are 17 large-scale CCS facilities around the world, capturing 30 million tons of CO2 every year, with other three expected to come online by the end of 2018. According to the International Energy Agency modeling, the uptake of CCS technology could deliver up to 13% of the cumulative emissions reductions needed by 2050 to limit global temperatures from rising over 2 degrees Celsius, thus preventing the emissions of 6 billion tons of CO2 every year. Yet, environmental concerns associated with the potential leakages of CO2, public oppositions to new projects and the high costs associated with the deployment of CCS represent major barriers to the deployment of these technologies. It is the full diffuse opinion that only the installation at the global level of carbon markets that assign a competitive price for the carbon emissions avoided through CCS is likely to boost the uptake of these technologies. Additionally, governments should take major steps towards accelerating CCS deployment by prioritizing the identification of CO2 storage sites as a strategic national asset. This involves undertaking pre-commercial exploration and assessment to develop a publicly available base-level understanding of national and regional CO2 storage. Finally, successful deployment of CCS will require improved efforts to ensure that local communities and the general public understand and accept these technologies. Permanent geological storage of CO2 is a relatively new and unknown concept for many people and as such it raises legitimate concerns about safety and risks.